about. And now I'm turning to uh, Victoria Grace Walden and Mikola Machortik. Um, Dr. Victoria Grace Walden is a senior lecturer in media and director of learning enhancement in the School of Media, Arts, and Humanities at the University of Sussex. She leads the award-winning platform Digital Holocaust Memory. She's author of Cinematic Intermedialities and Contemporary Holocaust Memory um, to from 2019, and editor of Digital His Holocaust Memory Education and Research from 2021 as well as the forthcoming uh, The Memorial Museum in the Digital Age, um, forthcoming 2022. Um, yeah, so the floor is yours and, oh, you're presenting together. So I will present <laughs> Mikola Machortik as well. Uh, he is a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Communication and Media Studies, University of Bern. Uh, his current research focuses on how the representation of traumatic pasts, in particular the Holocaust, is influenced by online platforms and algorithm systems. He's an editor of the journal Studies in Russian, Eurasian, and Central European New Media and the book, of, and the book series Transdisciplinary Trauma Studies, De Goethe. So now the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Um, while we've got the floor, I just wanted to point out I've put some leaflets near the biscuits um, to entice you <laughs> um, for the Digital Holocaust Memory Platform. It's an ongoing blog space at the moment. So if you're doing anything about digital Holocaust memory and you want to write something, either as an academic or someone working at a museum, archive, whatever, please give us some stuff. Um, and now we're doing the paper, which is why we're really here. Uh, yeah, it works. Um, <laughs> always, always happy when technology works. So... Um, we were really interested, in, we're going to focus on the year 2020, um, which was this obviously really unprecedented year because of the lockdowns, but it was unprecedented for genocide memory because we had the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, um, the liberation of the last Nazi concentration camps, Bubassen, which people know um, less about, but also the 25th anniversary um, of Srebrenica as well. So for European Holocaust memory particularly, but also kind of global World War II uh, related history, it was this kind of phenomenal year, all these events were supposed to happen, these huge major anniversaries, and then <laughs> everyone had to go online. So we thought, well, this would be really interesting to look at, um, because as discussed earlier, social media was, we assumed, was going to be really, really at the forefront of the communication strategies of all of the sites. Um, and so we were interested in two questions. Uh, what hashtags did institutions use to create social media camp campaigns to promote these online commemoration events? And then how did the use of these hashtags by institutions compare with more public engagement with those hashtags? Um, and kind of from a theoretical perspective, we were really interested in the kind of narrative in, in Andrew Hoskins' work, who's a, a memory uh, studies scholar, really interested in the digital. Um, and in 2014, he was talking about this idea of a bifurcation of memory. So he was arguing there's this very organized institutional memory culture and this emerging, fragmented, disorganized uh, culture as well. By 2018, he seems to believe the institutional and the organized has kind of disappeared. Um, but in that same volume, Wolf Kansteiner um, talks about the fact that um, whilst institutions, he thinks, are not particularly visible on social media, the memory traditions that they developed continue to dominate. And he sort of suggests this idea that there's a decorum upheld. So even if it's not the memory institutions or the kind of memory experts that are the most visible, um, it is at least the kind of standards or, or the kind of traditions of memory culture created in those spaces that people are doing in a way that people are kind of perhaps hesitant of doing something different because they might kind of be lambasted for being inappropriate, etc. So, that was where we started. Yep. Uh, as quite some people know in this, uh, you might definitely like to talk about methods. So, thanks a lot for Vicky to actually giving me this opportunity. So, pretty much as Vicky noted, uh, we were really interested in uh, how institutions commemorate those important anniversaries and what kind of activities also arise in the digital spaces around those institutionalized commemorations. So, what we did, or what, to be precise, Vicky did, because I actually joined the project on the later stage. So we basically approached those organizations and then basically asked them 
what kind of hashtags and what kind of accounts they actually use in order to create content and also disseminate content related to those anniversaries. Then pretty much we just uh, did some fancy digital stuff. So we actually used some APIs, both uh, provided by the meta, and here you think, can think about the crowd tangle. Definitely can recommend you also to use this, pretty trivial to use. And then Twitter API, a bit harder, but still possible to collect quite some data. And then what we actually did, we used those nice APIs to actually collect data from those platforms about the content with the hashtags that we identified, and that was actually published around the anniversaries. Pretty much then we actually looked at the data and there was quite some data collected. And then we actually were decided that we probably would be interested in looking specifically at the most popular uh, content based on the ideas of Stefania, who is unfortunately not here. So pretty much we used the metrics of the circulation and virality, which were operationalized as a number of interactions, both on the side of the more, I would say, public engagement with the past, but also uh, with uh, the content produced by the organizational accounts. And as you can see, we used quite a high thresholds, especially for the, I would say, more general content, not the one produced by the institutions, because indeed we actually found that it makes more sense to actually focus on those most popular content. In terms of the methodology, we actually used two approaches. First of all, we use distant reading, which is a really fascinating approach when you're having a lot of content, but do not necessarily that much time to actually read through all the content. And what distant reading basically does, it actually looks at the distribution of the voids in your data set. And then you can actually also look at what kind of context those uh, voids are used. And when you're actually having uh, subsets of data, which in our case was uh, the subset of the content produced by the institutions, but also content produced by the general public, you can actually draw some comparisons and look what is the differences in terms of the voids used by the different sites. And then finally, we also went for pretty traditional close reading, which is definitely a great, a great type of content when you're actually looking specifically on what is produced, what kind of meanings are put into the specific post, what kind of visual are accompanied, what kind of additional media are linked. And then I'm pretty much returning to back to Wiki. What was interesting with this project, the crowd tangle has a limitation and it only lets you look at public pages and public groups. Um, and that slightly changed the, changed the project from the initial intentions, which was to look at kind of the general public. But it became really interesting because in many ways our kind of, you know, each of our individual posts are not particularly high in their, their reach unless you're Lily basically, <laughs> on TikTok. Um, so the public pages are, if you look at the kind of array of the, the, you know, the posts that reach the most people, they are the ones that are reaching people. And actually, in most of the studies of Holocaust on social media, it's people just doing manual searches and searching the use of hashtags on, on public posts. And those aren't actually the posts that are getting the most reach. So in that respect, this kind of serendipitous limitation of crowd tangle um, allowed us to actually focus in on, on the most popular. We found three themes that we thought were interesting in terms of the comparison between the three case studies we looked at. And that was thinking about historical detail in posts, memory media, and appropriation. We didn't come up with these um, kind of themes in advance. It was by looking at those most popular posts, there was this kind of repeating pattern that posts tend to do at least one of these things. So they're the things we're going to concentrate on in this talk. So... We will start with historical detail. Um, this is uh, Jacqueline Morgenstar. And the top two posts related using the word Neuengammon in them in this time um, on Facebook were um, had her on there. And they were by Le Memorial uh, du Can and then the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, and she repeats again in the top two or three posts on Instagram. She's kind of almost this sort of Anne Frank of 2020. She's, she's this young female um, face, and, and a lot of the other images that we see in the most popular posts are also of children. What was really interesting about um, these top two posts, that most of the posts we saw um, were dominated by very kind of surface level superficial engagement, so likes. Everyone likes to like and share. It's really easy to do, particularly likes. Likes were overwhelmingly dominated all of the data set, which we expect. But apart from the posts with her on, so it, the top post had 1,018 comments, 2,779 shares, 1,184 angry emojis, 3,493 sad emojis, and only 711 likes. So it was really unusual in the kind of um, constellation of, of, of the interactions we were seeing. So it was really obvious that her image and story moved people in ways that other posts didn't seem to. Um, and obviously there's a kind of 
troubling trope here that there's a kind of infantilization and, and a, a feminization of victims. That if the victim is a female child, then we're getting far more interaction in here. And that, you know, there are problematic, kind of ugly anti Semitic tropes built into this, uh, this idea. Um, the top posts related to Noyan Gammon, they're not, not by the, the site itself, but, but kind of in the more public posts really emphasised individual stories. So the victims, sometimes heroes, you know, again, a problematic term, but kind of liberators, particularly in the Danish context. Um, and, what, and the references to perpetrators were very, very general. So when we did the text analysis, we see the term SS and fascism appear, but that's it. We don't see any other kind of reference to, to perpetrators. So they're very broad. Um, on the Neuengamme account specifically, um, there was a very different narrative. So it was much more about the present. So it was talking, it, survivors were mentioned, the sites and various um, elements of the site, the places in the site, and, and the staff were presenting um, their work. Uh, and, and, and Iris kind of pointed to some of this work um, earlier as well. So there was this kind of distinction in the, the more public posts, which were overwhelmingly more popular online, were actually more engaged with, with images, kind of stories from the past. What was really interesting in the overall data set was not just that um, the perpetrators were abstracted, but that the only word referring to victims was prisoner in either English or German. Um, and with Jacqueline, she's Jewish. And if you go through the, to the encyclopedia page, you find, eventually scroll down that page and you find that picture on her profile. And the last liner, which is a bit blurry, it mentions um, experiments on Jewish children uh, and that she is a one example of... Yeah, of this phenomenon. Um, but the word Jew and Jewish never appears in our kind of top. And we're, we're going up to like words that we see 11 times from about you know, thousands of times. And the word Jew does not appear in that context at all. Neither do any other prisoner groups of concentration camp. The kind of words that we might expect when people are talking about um, the Holocaust. So. Yep, thank you, Vicky. So I will talk a bit about so what we found in the case of Srebrenica, also pretty much because it's easier for me to pronounce Srebrenica than Noen Gammon. Uh, so in terms of Srebrenica, as you can see on the screen, there definitely were quite some differences from what Vicky was just talking about. So pretty much what we observed in the case of the Srebrenica can be probably summarized along the three or four, I would say, key features. One of those features you can definitely see on in terms of the visuals I think to the left, yes, to the left. I'm always so bad with the directions. So what you can actually see to the left is that unlike the case of the Noen Gaman, you do not necessarily see the images of the dead people. In the case of the Srebrenica, you actually see the images of the living people who are mourning the dead. Whereas you actually do not necessarily see dead people themselves. What you actually see in the case of Srebrenica is really the strong emphasis on the mourning of the living, but uh, those who are dead are somehow remain not necessarily invisible, but at least much less visible in the case of the visuals. We also find it pretty interesting uh, in terms of the textual content, which to a certain degree also follows the same principle. What you can see in the case of the Noen Gamma is really strong focus on indeed the individual. In the case of the Srebrenica, we observe a pretty different situation. When you see a Srebrenica post dealing with the victims, you're basically seeing a lot of numbers. 17 Bosnian Muslim civilians, 8,000 Bosnian Muslims who were massacred. So you definitely have this very strong quantification, which is, I would say, definitely provides a different mode of the remembrance when you actually don't necessarily going really specifically focus on the individual stories, but you're focusing more on the numbers, probably in order to emphasize the importance of what happened, because you might, can, because you might imagine that for some people it's still probably not necessarily as established to as for instance, the Holocaust. What we also find pretty interesting is that uh, when you actually looked on the textual analysis using this wonderful distant reading, is that the word Bosnian was actually used in general far more than the Muslim. So you definitely had a pretty strong construction of the victim as Bosniaks, but not necessarily as Muslims, at least in the case of the majority of the post. And we will definitely talk also about more appropriation-like posts later in the presentations. And in the case of the more appropriation-focused post, you definitely had a stronger focus on the Muslim side of the story. 
And finally, what we also find very interesting is basically what we can note there was definitely not the strong focus on the perpetrators. You basically had occasional mentions of actually Serbians who were behind this, but actually Post did not necessarily really went into the detail. And we actually find it very interesting because you basically having a strong focus on the number of victims, but you don't necessarily really focus on who the perpetrators were, even while in the case of some of those, we actually know the names of the perpetrators. So, and pretty much I'm returning back to Vicky. And then there is Bubasen, which we felt really sorry for in our research. We found five posts of the whole of social media. It's the 75th anniversary of the liberation uh, of this internment camp that was uh, run under kind of, in British-controlled uh, Mauritius for uh, Jewish refugees that had arrived in Palestine and then were deported from there by, by, the, by the British to um, British mandate pa uh, Palestine. Is and then was sent here for the rest of the war. Five posts. And there was a campaign by the Johannesburg uh, Holocaust and, and Genocide Center to really support the work of Ubassin because they have social media and still there's only these five posts and they tend to circulate similar stuff. What's interesting here though is that they are, uh, it's again kind of very similar to Srebrenica in that we're getting the, the kind of core facts, the numbers, the dates, the, the, who the victims are and the numbers. Um, of victims, but um, and then links out to other content. There's a, there's a very small amount of content. There's a podcast and a news article, and they are the things that are circulating over and over, well, not over and over again. They circulate each once uh, online. Um, but there feel, there's a feeling here, of kind of, we, we needing to create new content to tell this past because it's almost at risk of being forgotten. Um, yeah, in the same year, where we're seeing far more stuff about more general things about the end of the war. Move to media memory then. Um, as you might expect, in the general kind of public posts about, uh, about Neuengamma, we're seeing um, lots and lots of black and white archive images. There is the World War II colorized photo uh, site that comes up quite high in the ranks with one color image, um, but generally the kind of classic black and white uh, images, um, either of liberation or of kind of personal photographs, and some more kind of problematic images of, kind of medical experiments on children as well. So those are the most popular posts in terms of the kind of media memory. And this is quite interesting. So in the more public um, pages, um, we are seeing the remediation of archive content. And then um, the Noreen Gammon site tends to create new content. So it is content about the site, about the commemoration, short videos um, by um, curational staff and other staff there. Um, then in terms of Srebrenica, again, we have new video content. Um, but remembering Srebrenica, um, does campaigns, so they get um, often government officials of certain types of this, the Mayor of London here, Sadiq Khan, um, um, and Angelina Jolie's there, um, and hers is the most popular post by far, which isn't surprising. So they, their video content isn't about their staff talking about their work, but is getting kind of advocates from, from either political spheres or celebrity spheres um, to do posts. And, and Angelina Jolie is a UN uh, envoy, I think, at this point, but there's also other celebrities um, that were involved there. The archive imagery we're seeing circulating more generally, and remember Sitzka doesn't circulate this stuff, is being led particularly by Al Jazeera English, England, uh, English rather, um, who have been behind a lot of the memory projects with Memory Srebrenica, but it's television footage or old colour images from the, from the 90s. Um, and again, it's kind of this remediation of the, of the archive of that particular moment. What is also really interesting, though, is we also see a substantial amount of native videos being put up by leaders of nations that have large Muslim populations outside of Europe. So this genocide um, happening in Europe is it's some of the most popular posts are from politicians outside of Europe, whereas with the Holocaust, most of the posts that are popular are from in, in Europe and quite dispersed in terms of language. So we have Danish, French, German, and English posts in, in that kind of most popular uh, group. The other kind of media memory we see is these very aestheticized um, memorial um, posts. So organizations gen kind of taking pictures of, uh, yeah, or sharing photographs of the parts of the Sebenitska memorial is really, really common in these kind of grayish uh, or kind of sepiaized uh, images. We see it a little bit in relation to Noyengama. Um, they tend to be more juxtapositions like this, but it's rarer than it is for Srebrenica. We have some, you know, questionable juxtapositions here. So we have the kind of memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe with an image of the bombed 
which we're assuming is Berlin, given the context of the image, um, and a kind of merging of the kind of victims of fascism or war and the Holocaust and this kind of blended narrative, I guess, where Srebrenica is much more specific about Srebrenica itself. Bubassin, then again, I've already mentioned, has this kind of newly produced content about the past. Um, so while they're using some images here, um, it's very much about kind of a news article that's been made, a podcast that's been made, and an event that's been uh, created to remember this event as well. What's interesting then in terms of this kind of remediation um, is that we don't see much actual use of the affordances of social media itself in this year. Um, Seb Sebenitska and Bubassin that didn't give us any hashtags which specified a campaign. So Bubassin, we were given a list of like South Africa, Johannesburg, Mauritius, Bubassin. Um, with Sebenitska, we were given Sebenitska, Sebenitska 25. Um, there was no kind of sense of a very specific campaign that had been developed for that year. Knowing Gamma had created uh, and was working with uh, kind of other institutions with 75 Liberation, 75 Before I Wrong, and had created specific Twitter accounts for the purpose of kind of recirculating you know, tweets that were using that. Those, those institutions that they retweeted were all um, well circulated already on Twitter, which was quite interesting. Um, so the hashtags that we were given... There was no logical connection between posts. They were just kind of... The only connection was the end of World War II, Srebrenica and Bubassan. There was no actual um, thread of a campaign. What we did find that was interesting in the Srebrenica context was this hashtag letters from Bosnia, which was not a hashtag they gave us, but was a campaign they had run. So when we asked them, like, what campaigns did you run, they hadn't clearly considered this was a campaign. Um, but it was a campaign of things that they had gathered offline and that they were posting. So it was basically a curation of um, these kind of fake-looking letters with little quotes from um, survivors on them. Interesting that they've mocked them up as letters, so they're remediating or kind of recreating an older form of media. Um, it was interesting to reflect back on this this year after the We Remember campaign, which did use that kind of participatory... Um, dimension of social media to get people to you know, share a hashtag we remember. So it wasn't about an institution only posting their own things around we remember. It was using you know, the dispersal of this idea of we remember getting lots and lots of people to use it. And the three most popular posts on Instagram related to Holocaust Memorial Day this year um, were all about all using the we remember hashtag. So we didn't search the we remember hashtag here. We searched yeah, HMD yeah, Holocaust Memorial Day, etc. And it was the We Remember campaign that came to the fore there. So we don't see that kind of participatory campaigns around hashtags in 2020. Yep. And I will also now talk about the third uh, theme that we identified together with Wiki, so pretty much appropriation. So what you basically can see uh, on the screen is appropriation-related content relate in relation to the Noen government. And pretty much, uh, it was quite different from the content that was actually promoted and produced by the institution. You definitely can recognize that the content produced by the institution was very much focused on the site's history, also its events, so pretty much what Iris was talking in her talk. In the case of the content that was actually coming from the outside, from, let's say, the general public, we actually observed something pretty different. Basically, what we think that is, uh, our observation can be more or less structured along the three axes, I would say. The two of them are basically located on the right and on the left uh, of uh, the screen. So basically, you can see the, I would say, two uh, more or less left-leaning interpretations or appropriations of the Noen Gamma memory. So in some cases, you actually see uh, the calls to actually declaring the 8th of May to be a national holiday in Germany. Uh, so pretty much actually constructing this as a day of the liberation, which is something that was, for instance, opposed quite heavily, I think, by the more, I would say, right-wing uh, political circles within the Germany. As well as, for instance, the narratives of uh, what we call an anti-fascist socialism with frequent references to the Buchenwald Oath, to this general narrative of uh, the need for the peaceful world uh, and actually fighting Nazism in different forms. In the center, we actually observe something interesting and something quite different. 
So basically, in the center, and this is the third trend of what we observed in terms of appropriation in the case of the Noin Gaman, we actually observed quite strong emphasis, I would say, of more type of national narratives of the Second World War as well as the liberation. You basically had some stories about the British prisoners of war. You had also some stories about the heroism of the Danish rescuers. And what we also find particularly interesting is also some contextualizations and also integrations of the liberation of the last uh, Nazi camps into the German history. It included, for instance, some claims made by the German officials. And I think that the one that was actually in the Chinese and that was kindly translated by Wiki is actually a really fascinating example. I think that it actually was the most uh, retweeted content, and Wiki will definitely correct me if I'm wrong. And I think it was actually produced by the German uh, official in the Hong Kong. That's why it actually writes in the Mandarin. And what it actually does, or at least it's how we actually read this, it pretty much takes the memory of the Second World War as well as the liberation of the camps and basically integrates it into the German history. It basically tells us that, okay, it was really horrible, but based on this terrible, horrible story, the Germany really moves in the right direction. So it basically integrates this problematic memory and now really becomes, I would say, a flagship of actually dealing with the human rights and also tackling the very complicated memory issues. Now, in the case of Srebrenica, and Vicky, can you please kindly click this thing because I'm afraid of it. Uh, okay, so in the case of the Srebrenica, we actually observed again quite something different. So if in the case of the Neuen Garmin, we actually observed, I would say, appropriation on more or less on the national level, be it the level of the Germany, or be it, for instance, the level of the Britain or Denmark. So in the case of Srebrenica, we actually observed something that we argue is kind of a more transnational type of the memory narrative. First of all, it is reflected in the number of the different languages in which post appeared, and we already noted it briefly, so we definitely had a massive, massive variety of the posts uh, which mentioned Srebrenica. And then actually the appeals made in relation to the Srebrenica actually referred, I would say, to the general transnational narrative. Specifically, what you find is a very common reference to the Islamophobia, which was not necessarily something that was, uh, I would say, a very common framework of referring to, but the framework that was actually very intensively retweeted. It was also coming in some cases from the international politicians, such as the former uh, president, uh, such as former, uh, uh, I think, prime minister of the Pakistan, Imran Khan, who was actually referring to the Srebrenica in, the, in relation to the Kashmir. Or for instance, one of the posts that we really find very interesting and which is located, I think, to the upper right corner. So it basically reads, July 2020 marks 25 years since the Srebrenica massacre is a murder of over 8,000 Bosnian Muslims, ethnic cleansing of over 20,000 20, people. The world has a collective responsibility to ensure history is not repeated. What is happening is IOJK and Palestine is chillingly similar. So it's definitely seeing how the memory of the Srebrenica in this case is definitely applied to this general and we would say more broader narrative about Islamophobia. What we also find pretty interesting is uh, the post on the left. Uh, and probably it's, I would definitely try to start interpreting it and then Vicky would jump in because I think it's definitely something that Vicky can do better than me. So I really find this post fascinating because it basically tries to build the connection between the whiteness of the victims of the Srebrenica in order, as we would actually probably interpret it, to connect the audience and actually try to convince the audience that, okay, it was important because the victims were actually white. They were actually similar to the people who possibly reading those posts. And it's definitely not something that they should be ignoring. So we really find this uh, appropriation strategy pretty fascinating. And as again, as you see, it was quite different compared with what we observed in the case of the Noin Gaman. Yeah, what was particularly kind of peculiar with this post was that in order to, it seems to kind of encourage a white European audience to empathize with the victims of Bosnia and then says, you know, but they were Muslim, it uses that kind of really cliche Aryan image of whiteness. So it says, you know, they were blonde-haired, blue-eyed white Europeans, like you. And so this is really bizarre kind of you know, confusion and convolution of kind of political messages kind of squashed in, in, into one. And with the German post with Sebenitska, what was really interesting is all from kind of German official government accounts of different, of different forms, was that within the German national posts at that political level, they, they started with Germany and then int yeah, internationalized 
um, Holocaust movement. So it was always on this kind of human rights um, context and kind of we're leading or we're engaging in human rights across the world now. Um, so this is just like, yeah, a quick snippet of some of our findings. There are many, many uh, CSP documents of, of tweets and, and Facebook and Instagram posts. But kind of some of our conclusions that we've discovered um, are here. So you know, the first point is that although there was kind of some evidence of a bifurcation of memory culture in public posts, there didn't seem to be a really clear delineation always um, between kind of institutional and, and non-institutional memory. Um, but there, was a, there were really disparate articulations. So the institutions we were particularly looking at, for example, it was Noyan Gammon. Noyan Gammon's work seemed particularly different from a lot of the public, more public, general public posts. But the, some of the most popular public posts were about other memory institutions. So it wasn't that there was a very clear difference between what, like, all memory institutions were doing the same thing and everyone else was doing something different. Um, and there wasn't a dispersal of specific messages like we, you know, the, the We Remember campaign kind of does that in 2022, but rather this really diverse range of, of uses of the past. So it was really fragmentary. Um, and the institutional posts were by far less visible. So um, we had to change that threshold for popular. We were 1,000 posts for Bosnia. So some of those top posts were getting 30,000 hits. In terms of knowing Gamma and the end of World War II, we were in the 10, 000, around 10,000 mark. None of the institutions had posts that were having total interactions over 200. So those, those particular case studies were kind of really not that visible in our space. Um, however, that kind of, these kind of historical aesthetics and traditions of memorialization were still there. So you know, lots of archive imagery was appearing in the most popular posts. The kind of classic political address to the camera was really popular. Um, but historical specificity was, was minimal in general. The, you know, the sites we were looking at were doing that far better. But in terms of those really popular um, posts, there was often, you know, perpetration was often abstract. The victim groups were kind of abstract as well. Um, the national kind of memory cultures were persisting in relation to the end of World War II and the liberation of the last Nazi concentration camps. In Bosnia, it was far more of a transnational memory and really making connections between um, different atrocities. And Bjorbasan was barely visible beyond Jewish circles. So the, it was you know, a Jewish press, um, a Jewish organization, and then the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. They were the only people discussing Bjorbasan. So one thing we thought was interesting in that comparison between Bubassan and, and Noyengama was that on social media, it's clearly not the temporal distance of an event from now that defines the stage of its memory culture, but rather the diversity of communication strategies and voices discussing it. Um, and yet, kind of the more diverse that conversation is and the more people are involved in it, it's, there's, no, there's no evidence of kind of connectivity happening between those things. It doesn't necessarily bolster um, a sense of a clear memory culture um, happening. And so it's really evident that cliches and tropes just kind of are continuing to achieve the reach. And we, one of the things we were kind of wondering or kind of speculating about, about is that when organizations are really diverse in their content, like United States Holocaust Memorial Museum put loads and loads of content out, but the ones that are get, becoming really popular are the ones that are the kind of tropes and the cliches. It's not that kind of the more nuanced stories that people know less about or the kind of different kinds of victim groups. Um, so our kind of um, end point then is that there's kind of very little evidence of much connectivity between and across accounts, um, except that kind of brief moment of Jacqueline Morgenstar's momentary kind of Anne Frank moment. Um, and we did observe that kind of connectivity with the We Remember campaign this year, but it's on a really superficial level. So when I first saw those posts, I was like, We Remember what? Only one of them says the word Holocaust on the piece of paper. Um, and so the kind of challenge I think we all face now is how do we complement the connectivity across posts? How do we build a kind of connected memory culture whilst also retaining the Holocaust specificity? Because I think there was a move in the last two years towards a more connective way. And we see this between various um, sites in, in Germany doing kind of various, uh, you know, the TikTok things and also the Zoom calls. But how do we kind of make the connectivity outside of the institutions but also retain historical specificity as well? <laughs>